she ran around the table, but I cut up with her. She was screaming, and I I grabbed the knife, and I started walking towards her, and she started panicking. Yeah. I think I got her by the hair or by the arm and just ooh, sunk it in her. I stabbed her. I stuck it in his arm and twisted it. I f***ed him up. Why your son? The devil had me. Every time I stab him, he just scream. Oh. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. He just scream and, Dad! I punched him right in the face. He wouldn't die. I was so angry at my family, I wanted them dead. 911, what is your emergency? I just killed my family. What's the name? I'm evil. How dare you? Are you sure that you did this and you're not dreaming? I hope to God this is a dream. I hope I am just freaking out. I hope to God it is, but it's not. It's real. I haven't been sleeping. I had really hard time getting up. I had really hard, 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 hard time sleeping. Why is your family up at this time of the morning? Because I scared the s*** out of them. I was screaming at the top of my lungs. Uh-huh. And I killed them. Okay, how many are there? Three. Why have you killed them? How old are they? Uh, my wife is, uh, 28. My daughter's family, my son's fourth. This isn't a joke. Okay. This Why is not here by the way, because I am terrified. Why did you do this? I felt like it was the will of God. I was scared of God to mom and I did it. Have you been having some problems? I'm not myself. I'm I'm Have you been drinking tonight? No, I'm not. Okay. Where's your night at? It's in my phone. In the early morning hours of May 30th, 2009, 29-year-old Michael Miller called 911 with a chilling message. Moments ago, he claimed to have killed his wife and two children. Michael apparently spiraled out of control, launching a rampage that resulted in a case that unfolds like a real-life horror story. However, as Michael recalls the details of his vicious crime, authorities grapple with trying to uncover the truth of what really happened that night. The following footage has been evaluated by a professional team, including a licensed professional counselor and a licensed clinical psychologist. After an unusual 911 call, authorities aren't sure what to expect as they arrive at the Miller suburban family home in Glendale, Arizona on May 30th, 2009. But it wasn't this. As they pull up to the house, Michael Miller is standing outside, wearing nothing but his underwear. He's barefoot and confused, his entire body stained with blood. In his 911 call, he seemed to be lucid, but now something is different. He tells police he's not sure what happened. The only thing he knows is that he's mentally unwell and his entire family is dead inside. Or so he thinks. Suddenly, Michael's voice drops to a hair-raising whisper. He tells first responders he's been possessed, ominously warning that something serious is happening to his soul. What authorities would find inside the home would leave them utterly haunted, questioning whether Michael was an evil genius a victim of circumstance, or something in between. As police enter the residence, they're met with a horrifying scene. A broken cell phone lay in pieces on the floor next to a dent in the wall. Empty alcohol bottles cluttered surfaces, and several family photos rested in a heap next to the living room couch, a couch that was converted into a makeshift bed. Like everything else, the blanket and pillow were freshly stained with red. Stains are splashed across the walls, with pools collecting underneath three victims on the floor. Throughout the home, red footprints mark the steps of their killer in the moments just after his brutal attacks. Police rush to help Michael's family, but they're too late. His wife, 28-year-old Adriana Miller, and their daughter, 10-year-old Valerie, show no signs of life. Their attention shifts when they hear a soft cry from Michael's four-year-old son, Brian. Somehow, despite severe injuries, he's still breathing. Police wait for backup, but the boy is fading fast. Every second counts, and he's dropping in and out of consciousness. Once help arrives, the four-year-old is airlifted to a nearby hospital. His injuries are so extensive, authorities know they're inches away from declaring this home the scene of a triple homicide. Michael Miller has some explaining to do. This is going to feel so good getting these cuffs off. Oh, oh, probably hurt, huh? After yeah, a while. very bad. Oh, oh shoulder. Oh. 
Back at the station, Michael wastes no time complaining. While childish, this behavior isn't entirely unusual after committing a crime. It's a way for perpetrators to attempt to play the victim. However, they usually aren't acting like this, to this extreme degree. Michael may also be using his discomfort as a distraction, in hopes of avoiding the discussion that's to come. Yet evidence of Michael's recent violence is written all over his body. A red handprint stains his right arm, and strange marks are on the tops of his feet, marks that Michael will repeatedly draw attention to during his interview. Once he's alone, Michael begins speaking to himself. That's good. Michael is in a modified pyramid pose with his hands, typically associated with being in control and confident. This is very strange considering the situation. You would think he would feel out of control. I'll be, I'll be bashful. I'll be telling the truth. Father God, I've come to you before you in the name of Jesus, asking you, Father, help me tell the truth. Don't let me be afraid of what's going to happen. Father, remind me. If I tell the truth, you deal with the consequences. So, Father God, it's up to you whether I get out of here or not. Father God, I love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Thank you. I love you, Father. I love you, Holy Spirit. Amen. Had a big smile on his face. I think they're okay. I think you guys are okay. I love you, baby. I miss you. I hate being here in jail. Oh, Father, I love you. Oh, just take me where you want me to go. You are in control. As the detective approaches the room, Michael makes a point to emphasize his feelings of discomfort. Ah, God, it hurts. My shoulders hurt so bad. Oh my god. Oh my god. Hey Michael. Hey, my shoulders hurt so bad. Is it like a little sore or? Like, yeah, it's, it's sore. It's because my arms were back there for so long and I was like, ah, it feels good to stretch them out. Oh. Can you lift them up? Stretch? Yeah. There you go. Oh, it feels good. Oh, I was in those cuffs for a long time. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. It's okay. Hey, uh, Michael, like I said downstairs, my name is Brad McMillan. I'm okay. a detective with the Glendale Police Department. Okay. okay. I was asked to come in here and talk to you about why we're here and what happened. I um, want to know. Yeah. Okay. And, Michael, do you like to go by Mike or Michael? Either or. It doesn't matter. I, I'm called Mike or Michael. It's, 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 it doesn't matter. Oh, Mike, okay. whatever, whatever you're comfortable with. The detective starts by collecting background information, which can help him establish a baseline for Michael's behavior. Understanding how Michael communicates during routine conversation makes it easier to pick up on deception in the future. In Michael's case, this baseline is especially important. During his 911 call, he shared with authorities that he's been diagnosed as both bipolar and schizophrenic. Early in the investigation, authorities are always on high alert, looking for any indication that suspects aren't being truthful. And they know it's not unusual for people to falsely claim mental illness. However, suspects often think they can get away with crimes if they claim mental instability, which can lead to falsification or exaggeration of symptoms. For now, the detective works on building rapport by asking how long Michael and Adriana have been married. 11 years. Well, wow. this, uh, this August will be 11 years. How long were you guys dating before that? Um, a year, year and a half, year and four months. Well, we, got, we, we started dating on April 8th, and we got married uh, August 8th. Yeah, a year and four months. 
Where'd you guys meet? Wendy's. 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 Like, were you guys working there? We, we were working there, and uh, I was closing, and she was closing, and I went in there and said, hey, you want to kick it with me? Want to come out with me? You know, be my girl? And, oh, I don't know. I don't know. And then she like, yeah, okay, I'll do it. And then we've been together ever since. Adriana's seemingly hesitant response is an eerie beginning for this ill-fated love story. If only she knew that single decision would change the course of her life forever. Michael and Adriana married when they found out she was pregnant with their first child, Valerie. And eventually, Michael says, the pair both secured jobs working for the same health insurance company. While Adriana remained employed there, Michael wouldn't stick around too long. Instead, he gave up his job and went to work for Papa John's Pizza. What do you do there? I deliver pizzas. Oh, okay. I'm a pizza delivery driver. How long have you done that? Uh, I've been doing it for about three or four months now. Good job? Um, it started off good, but lately the economy's getting worse and less people are, are buying pizzas, so... Right. Yeah. Right. So it's kind of hit you too, huh? Yeah. But it's okay. Why'd you quit? Is it a long was, story or is it... I had a problem with alcohol. Oh, okay. And um, I, I, I got to the point where I wanted to drink alcohol every single right, day, right. all day. I'd get home from work, and I first thing I would do was pick up a beer. And I'd have 12, 13 of them, and I, that's not right. Michael tells officers that he had a recent wake-up call when it came to his alcohol use. One day, his son, four-year-old Brian, attended a class at church. He took the teacher by surprise when he asked if her soda was actually alcohol. And I was like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. And I was like, okay, i got to stop. And then I, I tried to quit on my own power, and I kept trying, God, just, I'll do this better. I'll do that better. And it didn't work. And then I did this. I, you know, I did this. I tried to kill myself. I was, I was serious about it. This mm -hmm. wasn't no joke. I, I did that really hard. I wanted to get out of there. I wanted out of life. While Michael's story about the attempt is certainly serious and worthy of concern, he may be sharing the story now as another way to try to victimize himself. By conveying his own suffering, he may feel that he'll win lenience later down the line. When was that? That was late September, early October. Oh, last year? Oh, oh wait, yes. Okay. okay. Yes. Did they take you to the hospital? Yes, mm -hmm. my wife did. From this point, Michael's behavior only gets more and more strange. Who's your doctor? It's a it's a county ba it's a county funded psychiatric unit. Doctors. How long have you been with them? Two thousand four. Michael explains that he's rotated through a few mental health specialists over the past few years. He struggles to remember exact timelines, but alludes to a major incident a few years prior that led to his diagnoses of bipolar and schizophrenic. Well, I got sick. I got sick in November. I was hospitalized in November. November, December, January. I started seeing him in dis November, December of 03. What do you mean you got sick? I thought people were following me. I thought, um, I thought, I thought cars were following me. I thought people were trying to kill me. I saw the spiritual battle that was being fought, and it made me panic because I couldn't understand. You know, the Bible says that even even Earth is it, it, it sees what happens and it and it trembles. And I know I, sometimes I saw the other day I saw something that kind of freaked me out. And I, well, what happened was it was I saw a crab like a like a like a sand crab. Mm -hmm. I, I saw it walking, and I looked, and then it turned into a leaf. Hmm. So I am really sick. Really bad. Hmm. The paranoia, persecutory delusions, and religious-themed delusions Michael describes are classic examples of psychosis. And under the right circumstances, these symptoms can be dangerous. Acts of extreme violence like Michael's are rare for people with psychosis, but inevitably, if a person acts on paranoia and delusions, there's a risk of them harming either themselves or those around them. As Michael explains his symptoms, the existence of some mental illness seems likely, but the severity of his symptoms and whether or not they could be the cause of what drove him to kill is still unknown. When he first arrived at the police station, Michael's behavior proved quite strange. Michael was kept in a holding cell while authorities prepared for his questioning, and police reports reflect that he was extremely agitated. He smeared feces on the walls and kicked the door repeatedly, threatening and yelling at nearby officers. 
and this wouldn't be the last time police would see erratic behavior from Michael. Police were left wondering, was his behavior the product of real mental illness, or could it be a ruse? Soon, they would get their answer. But I'm, I'm fine. Okay. What do you mean you're fine? I take the medicine. I get, if I, as long as I get sleep, oh, God knows I need sleep. If I, if I get sleep, I'm fine. I, I don't have these problems. How many hours of sleep did you get the night before? Roughly five or six. Oh, that's good. Yeah, I got a good night's sleep. After his recent episode of psychosis, Michael says he paid a visit to the doctor only two days before the murders. It was just recently um, increased. Okay. My, my dosage was increased the other day. Uh huh. So I increased my dosage on my bipolar medicine. And um, yesterday was my second day taking the dose that I was supposed to be taking. Right. And they also gave me a sleeping pill hmm. to help me sleep at night. Michael may be mentioning his bipolar medicine as some form of damage control. If he reminds the detective that he's bipolar, he may hope that could influence the way the detective perceives him and perhaps change the outcome of this interview. At the same time, the fact that Michael's medications were increased recently is a red flag. This, along with his claims of trouble sleeping, might signal recent stressors in Michael's life, including family troubles or it may point to an uptick in the severity of his symptoms. Meanwhile, as police search Michael's home, they make some strange discoveries. Tucked away in Michael's dresser are 63 pages worth of freshly printed documents, documents dated for the day of Michael's doctor appointment. The pages outlined mania, sleep disorders, bipolar, schizoaffective, and schizophrenia, and other mental illnesses in depth including definitions, symptoms, treatments, and common medications. Could Michael have been researching how to mimic a mental health crisis? The sheer amount of pages, 63 to be exact, certainly seemed to indicate that he was doing some intense research. Could he have been looking into what to report to police and how to act in order to malinger or exaggerate and fake his illness? Or is it possible that his wife could have been doing this in-depth research to try and figure out what was going on with Michael? It's important to keep this in mind as his interrogation gets underway. A cluster of red flags are often present in instances of malingering, including sharing a sudden onset of especially severe symptoms, describing unlikely combinations of symptoms like mania and increased sleep, and claiming to have highly specific and rare symptoms. While symptoms of true mental disturbances vary widely by individual, malingerers often follow subtle patterns in the way they describe their symptoms. For example, if malingerers claim auditory hallucinations, they often describe extremes, like hearing terrifying threats and obscene language. Individuals experiencing genuine symptoms, on the other hand, experience symptoms in degrees, often reporting that their hallucinations can seem conversational. Visual hallucinations are the most common symptom reported by malingerers, and they typically describe scenes in black and white or with a single pronounced color. Those with genuine symptoms often describe their experiences as having a full spectrum of color. Finally, when those with legitimate illnesses describe delusional thinking, they may become defensive when asked about their experiences, while those who are fabricating their experiences may not. With this strange discovery in mind, the detective knows it's time to get Michael's side of the story, but he could never imagine how truly gut-wrenching this story would be. Um, you know, obviously we need to talk about what happened okay. um, with you calling us, calling the department, the police department over. Can you just tell me what happened? I was at home. I didn't get any sleep last night. My wife, um, my wife got up and we were running around the house doing stuff, and I pulled out a knife and I stabbed her. I stabbed her. Stabbed my daughter, stabbed my son, punched my son in the face. I was trying to kill him. But it wasn't me. Really? It wasn't me. Who was it? It was, it was me. Um, you said it was you. Yes. Um, okay. This odd shift in comments is only the beginning of a truly bizarre story that's about to unfold. You said that you hadn't slept. Did you work last night? I worked last night, but I did not close. I got off at 9.30, I, th I think it was closer to 10, I can't remember. Um, but I came home and I ate. 10.30 at night? 10.30 at night, yeah, okay. or 10 or so, I don't remember. I came home uh -huh. and I, I had some food, 
took my medicine. You know, it was, it was before 10. It was before 10 because I remember having to tuck the kids in bed. When I got home, I, it, was, it was a little bit before 10. I said, tuck the kids in bed so we can hang out and watch TV and talk. And Do they normally go to bed at 10? Yeah, well, oh. on, on Friday and Saturday. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Um, how was business last night at work? Slow. Yeah, did you make well, I made I made 15, 20, 25 bucks. I made 25 bucks. Is that good? Not for a Friday night. What would be a good Friday night? Oh, 45, 50, oh. 55. Right. 70. So it's about <laughs> half, even almost yeah. a third. Okay. Yeah. Although the detective seems to pepper Michael with mundane questions, his approach is intentional. Questions like these allow authorities to accomplish two things. First, they might clue police into any obvious cognitive difficulties, which could shed light on Michael's ability to reason and think his actions through. Second, the questions can further establish rapport as the detective carefully eases Michael into more difficult topics. All right, so you came home. You tucked the kids in bed? Or did you have your wife tuck your kids in bed? My wife tucked the kids in bed. Okay. And, you, and we keep talking about your wife. And I, and I tucked them in bed. Okay. She tucked them in first, then I did. Well, That's my wife saying she wants more kids. I'm like, uh, not, not such a good idea. <laughs> I'm not mentally stable for that. Michael's ill-timed joke reveals a certain degree of self-awareness. In his circumstances, this is something that may determine his fate. Then what happened? Um, I said a prayer with my son. I rubbed his back and I said a prayer, tucked him in, and he fell asleep. What kind of prayer? Is it like a standard prayer? To Jesus. Prayer? No, we don't, we, don't, we don't usually pray. Uh-huh. We don't usually pray. We just, two weeks ago, I feel like I've been, I've been baptized with the Holy Spirit, uh-huh. with fire. I feel like I'm on fire for the Lord. Oh, good. So I'm trying to pray with him and teach him. Well, I'm not trying. I am praying mm-hmm. with him, and I'm doing things that the Lord wants us to do. What did you guys pray about? Um, um, I pray that the Lord would uh, keep him safe. We, we thank them for the house. We thank them for the car. We thank them for the food. We thank them for Mommy and Daddy. We so just them. your standard kind of a thank yeah. you to, to Jesus prayer? Yeah. Okay. And then what happened? Then I went and t- tucked in my daughter. Uh-huh. Did you, did you pray with your daughter? No, I don't think so. Okay. Aside from the fact that Michael didn't pray with his daughter, the details he shares about tucking her in are noticeably absent compared to his son. Perhaps this signifies nothing more than unique relationships with each of his children, but it may also point to more. Michael recalls a recent religious awakening that spurred his new prayer habit. This sudden connection could be harmless, but given Michael's religious preoccupation, it could also mark the onset of the psychotic episode that would change his life. Religious preoccupation in schizophrenia tends to occur more in cultures with more religious occurrence in the general population. It's important to remember that spiritualism and religious preoccupation is common among mentally healthy people, and that mental illness tends to just skew the normal behaviors to the extreme, which may be why this kind of preoccupation is often seen in schizophrenia, especially considering if someone was raised in a religious community. They may have been raised with an understanding that someone speaking out of thin air or an auditory hallucination could be God talking. So then when it starts to happen, it follows that they would automatically assume that's what the voice is. Then we went to, um, then we went to our room and we got some weed and, and smoked some weed. By weed, you mean marijuana? Marijuana. Yes. She, she smokes out of a bong. I smoke out of a pipe. Okay. And I smoked weed, um, a lot, about three puffs. Oh. It doesn't take much to get me high. Does your does your wife smoke a lot? Yeah, she smokes probably about a bowl. Okay. All right. So you guys smoke some weed? Yes. And then what? Um, we, we, we were watching TV. We put the weed away. We were watching TV. We, we were talking. We were talking. Oh. You remember what you guys were talking about? I think we were watching House Hunters on okay. HGTV. Okay, in your room or in the living room? In our room, okay. in our bedroom. Okay. Michael takes long pauses and leans forward, touching his face as if to physically hold himself back from saying something. He may be struggling to recall the timeline, or he may be so focused on telling it in a certain way that it consumes all his cognitive energy. Soon Michael will describe the moment everything changed for the Miller family. Pay attention to Michael's memory. Or lack thereof, and then, uh, then I, then we try, tried to sleep. I tried to go to sleep. But, well, I listened to my headphones when I was laying down. Mm-hmm. I had my MP3 player. I was listening to my headphones, and I laid down in bed, and uh, she fell asleep, and I, di- I didn't fall asleep at all. I, I, I kind of meditated for two hours, and then, 
uh, I got up and I lost train of thought. Uh, I meditated and I got up and I I went on the computer. I think I uh, oh, God help me. What am I? What did we do? That's when the fighting started. When, what, when I woke do up. Do you know what time this was about? The fighting. Yeah. I want to say about eight. Well, you got home at ten twenty. Oh the, no, we didn't fight that night. The fight was was this morning. This yeah. morning. What what, what time? What time were you guys fighting? Oh, we were fighting probably about. That was probably about four in the morning when I was when I went on the computer. I think. Oh, okay. So you've been up that whole time? Yeah, I've been up the whole time. Okay. Yeah, and then were you just having a hard time sleeping. I ha- I yeah uh, yeah I have I have I have medicine to help me sleep. It caused me to sleepwalk, and wow. do stuff in my sleepwalking. So. Um, so you're now, not taking that anymore? No, no, I'm not taking that anymore. So I'm taking something else now. And does that seem to work? Or? It worked the first night, but it didn't work last night. Have you only been on it two days? Yes. Okay. So you, you took the pill last night? Yes. Okay, and you didn't sleep? No. Michael mentions old medicine here, and he may be referring to Ambien as it's fairly notorious for causing sleepwalking and acting out while asleep. While it's unknown if he was actually taking Ambien, it does beg the question of the research he was doing. As Ambien has a history of effects, including hallucinations, there's the possibility that Michael researched this and is mentioning it here to set up a story. There's also a long delay before he says yes when asked if he's only been on it for two days. This pause could be an attempt to give himself a chance to think to make sure he answers the way he wants. It does seem convenient that he just had his meds changed and that he keeps emphasizing it. As he gets closer and closer to critical moments in his story, Michael's recollection fails him. He can't seem to nail down whether or not he slept, and the first timeline he offers doesn't add up. Memory troubles like these may be due to cognitive disturbances that are common in schizophrenia and schizoaffective disorders. However, Michael could be using his alleged diagnosis to say he had a reason to not remember and as a way to keep from having to answer. Okay, So about 4 a.m. you said? About 4 a.m. I woke up. And what happened? She, my wife got mad at me, really mad at me for yelling, and or she got mad at me for, um, for not, for not sleeping. Mm-hmm. She, I go, babe, you can't get mad at me for not sleeping. It's not, it's not my fault. And she, well, no, 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 She goes off, no, 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 and uh, I say, um, well, what the f- is your problem? And then I started meditating in my brain, mm-hmm. and I started thinking, okay, well, God the Father, Jesus the Son, who's the Spirit? Who's the spirit of God? And I started thinking it was Lucifer. I thought it was Satan. I thought it was God the Father. I thought he was married to Lucifer, and they had a son named Jesus. Okay. That's what I thought. And then uh, then I was indwelt by Satan, and I killed him. Well, wait, let's talk about that. You said you were enveloped with Satan? What, what was the word? Uh, in, indwelt. Okay. What does that mean? Uh, consumed. Michael describes an argument with Adriana that is suddenly eclipsed by an intense religious preoccupation. These preoccupations can be dangerous if the affected person feels like they're being commanded to act in a way that causes harm to another person. These kinds of thoughts can quickly cross over into delusions. Michael's preoccupation does just that, leaning into delusional territory as he describes an abrupt possession by Satan. Tell me a little bit about that. When you said you were... were Satan was in you. What what happens? I lost all control. I had no self control. None. Uh-huh. I I I just I just snapped and she became like a demon. All right. And I just This is an interesting thing to say and might actually be an issue in his story. Michael says that he snapped and then she turned into a demon, but it seems like it would be more logical to say that she turned into a demon and then he snapped and killed her. So what'd you do? I killed her. How? With the knife. Where was the knife? I stabbed her a lot. I don't know where. I mean, where where was the knife? Where did you get the knife? Uh, in our, in our, uh, in our knife, in our knife holder thing. Like. Michael touches his mouth here, and just before that moment makes a lip compression, which indicates a negative response to the questioning, as well as uncertainty as his answer also has an upward inflection. Well, how, tell me, how did you stab her? I mean, was she on the ground, or was she standing up? I blacked out. Yeah. I, I, I stabbed her at least four times. Okay. Um, Do you know where you stabbed her? No. Okay. Okay. Is she okay? 
Um, I, I would, I'll tell you everything okay, about okay. what's going on. Okay. So, um, I just don't want to lose our train of okay, thought okay. here. Okay, I'm sorry. As he asks, is she okay? Michael covers his mouth, which is a movement known as covering the lie, where people try to physically hide a lie. He likely made this movement because he already knows the answer and that she isn't okay. Before his interview, Michael has already acknowledged the deaths of his family members. Perhaps his question about Adriana's well-being is simply an attempt to shift focus away from himself or avoid telling the story, even if only for a moment. So, did you stab her first? Yes. Okay. I was screaming at her. I was screaming at her. I said, shut the f*** up. I started taking songs from Eminem's music. Uh -huh. I started taking lyrics from Eminem's music and saying, you're going to f***ing die, b here comes Satan. I'm the Antichrist. I'm going to kill you. You're f***ing gone. Uh -huh. and, I, and I started stabbing her. I did. Mm -hmm. I did. How, do you know how many times you stabbed her? If I was to guess, I would say four, but maybe okay. three, maybe five. And was she standing up or was she on the ground? She was standing up. I think I got her in the stomach. Okay. And then she fell to the ground? or Yeah. Did you stab her while she is on the ground? In the heart. Oh. Did you punch her at all? Yes, in the face. Before or after you stabbed her? Maybe both. Uh, I stabbed my daughter, too. Yeah, tell me about that. She came over, and she started freaking out, and she, Daddy, stop! And I just got it and just right in the middle of her chest. I just dug, I just dug it right into her chest. Uh -huh. So she came out after you were stabbing your wife? No, I had the knife in my hand, and I was, and I was going to stab her when she came out. When your daughter came out? Yes. Because you knew she was going to come out? or I didn't know she was going to come out. I, th I, thought, I thought there was a certain spell on the house, and I didn't think she would actually get up and come out. I thought, I thought Satan was going to keep everyone asleep so I could just kill her, but I didn't know what I was going to do with the other two kids. But with my, I, do, I was going to kill my wife, but I didn't know what to do with them. After hinting that he planned to kill his daughter in advance, Michael immediately backtracks. So tell me about that. She was screaming, and I, I grabbed the knife, and I started walking towards her, and she started panicking yeah. like you would not believe. And I got her, I think I got her by the hair or by the arm, and just ooh, sunk it in her. Right, right. Got her. In the chest or her stomach? I or? think in the chest. Okay, then what happened? She fell to the ground, and her eyes were open. She looked like she was... Okay. Talk to me. What do you think? Oh, is she freaking out because she just saw her mom? Well, or... she saw me with the knife threatening uh -huh. her. Oh. She ran around the table, but I caught up with her. Oh, okay. And then what happened? I stabbed her. Okay. I think I grabbed her hair. I... Okay. It's, it's kind of... It's kind of patchy. I don't have exact... Okay. I don't have exact frame, frame by frame details, because I'm... The whole time I was in there, I was trying to ignore it and, and fight it and, 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 not, and not, not see it. Right. Michael does an eye-blocking movement to cover his eyes, which is often seen when someone doesn't want to see or remember something they've seen. He then exaggerates this by actually closing his eyes. So did you only stab her once? I think so. Okay. Did you punch her? I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. Okay, you said her eyes were open. Wait, wait. Yeah. Did, did you leave the knife in her, or did you just stab her with it? I just stabbed her and took it out. Okay, it, was it the same knife as with your wife? Yes. Oh, okay. okay. After describing an act of horrifying violence toward his own daughter, Michael shares sickening details about his four-year-old son's attack. Uh, I was the worst on him. I stabbed him the most. I stabbed him in the back. I, I stuck it in his arm and twisted it. Uh -huh. I, I f***ed him up. Why? Why, why, why your son? The devil had me. Uh -huh. It wasn't me. Right. It wasn't me. It was me, but it wasn't. It wasn't my insides that that could do that. Mm -hmm. It wasn't my insides that could kill my family. Right. But it, well, I guess what I'm asking is, is why him so many times? Because he wouldn't die. Right. Every time I stab him, he just scream. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. He just scream and God. Right. <sighs> Where on his body did you stab him? You said you got in him the in the back, arm. And in the back, back, in the arm, in the stomach. In the back a couple times. I punched him right in the face. I just... Why'd you punch him in the face? Because I wanted him to die. Because I was indwelt by Satan. Right. Then I see my wife laying in a pool of blood. Uh -huh. I see my daughter laying in a pool of blood. I get up and I have peace. I'm like, why do I have peace? 
Michael describes being, in his words, indwelled or possessed by Satan, yet shows no signs of distress. If he truly felt he was possessed by an evil entity, this should be the moment of reckoning, the moment he realizes the agony he caused his family in what he believes was a possessed state, the moment he feels total devastation over his actions, whether or not he was in control. But that moment doesn't come. I was like, I feel calm. I'm like, okay, God is doing something here. I just don't know what he's doing. And then, um, and then, I, then I, I got some blood on me. And then I came and I got into, I don't know what happened to my feet. I don't know what this is all about. They look like piercings, like Jesus. Let's rewind to when Michael first entered the interrogation room. As we saw early in the interrogation, Michael had strange circular marks on the top of each foot. Here, Michael compares these to the markings Jesus Christ received during the crucifixion. For now, the detective ignores Michael's comment and moves on. But Michael doesn't plan on dropping the conversation. Well, how did you get all the blood all over you? Is this when you were stabbing? When I when I was stabbing them, and I put my hand in there, and then I, I must have tried to wipe. I don't... Is that your handprint right there in your, your arm, or is that? It might be. I don't. I, uh, it might be. Did anybody? Did any of them grab you when you were stabbing them? No. No, I don't think so. Okay. Okay. Then what happened? Then I I I tried to make a cigarette. I, I rolled a cigarette because I rolled my own cigarette. So uh -huh. I rolled a cigarette, and I was I was kind of in a panic. I had peace, but I was in a panic. I just kind of walked around like, okay, what do I do? What do I do? And I was looking at him. And I was looking at him. I was like, are you? I just wanted them just to die. I was so angry at my family. I wanted them dead. Michael's words indicate more than just passing anger. Instead, they seem filled with long-standing resentment. Yet he also absolves himself of responsibility, claiming evil forces were in control. Michael's disturbing lack of remorse seems like a clear sign of a cold-blooded killer. But reduced emotional expression, also known as flat affect, is common in cases of mental illness. It can also be a side effect of psychotropic drugs, like the ones Michael was prescribed. If Michael was in fact in a state of psychosis, it will eventually pass. And when it does, crushing regret and guilt may finally surface. I wanted them dead, but then I got then I got here. Well, what, why were you so angry with your family? Satan. I, like I said, I, I, I was telling God, I was praying to God. I was uh -huh. praying to Jesus, that Jesus, okay, your father's the father, and Satan must be the spirit because you know, the spiritual side comes from... I know, but what I'm asking you is, is, is why are you so mad at the family? I don't know. I don't know. I don't. Okay. I've, I've never had that kind of anger or hate towards them like I had this morning. Okay. Michael's delusion suggests he may be in the midst of a psychotic episode at this very moment, but he doesn't appear to also be in a state of mania. In his case, this is an important distinction. People in severe manic episodes can be challenging to converse with. In their excited state, they may struggle to string ideas together as coherently as Michael does. While Michael seems to have incidents of mania, like when he was highly active and agitated in his holding cell, or during the murders themselves, the absence of mania during psychosis suggests that he may not actually be suffering from bipolar disorder. Instead, his symptoms point to an illness that would have an extreme impact on his ability to have any semblance of a normal life. Episodes of psychosis without mania occurring at the same time mean it's likely that he either suffers from schizoaffective disorder or may simply be schizophrenic. While schizoaffective disorder can include symptoms of both bipolar and schizophrenia, these two disorders aren't commonly diagnosed together as Michael describes. It's a thought that they may exist on opposite ends of the psychosis spectrum. All right, so you were trying to roll a cigarette. Yes. Okay, and then what? I rolled it. Uh -huh. I rolled it, and I, I went to light it, and then, uh, and then I was light, I, when I lit it, I called. Called who? 911. Okay. I called them. I said, I have my family to come, and she said, are you sure you're not dreaming? Are you sure you're not dreaming? I said... I'm sure this is real. Are you sure that you did this and you're not dreaming? I hope to God this is a dream. I hope I am just freaking out. I hope to God it is, but it's not. It's real. So, um, she came, or she didn't know. She, I called and I lit my cigarette, and then, then I talked. When I was talking to her, she just kept me on the phone, mm -hmm. and my cigarette burned out, and I threw it down. 
and I don't I don't know if I threw it out outside or inside, but I didn't I didn't finish it. Okay. I didn't finish my cigarette. Interesting. The detective is right. This detail is interesting. At the point in his story where his family lay dying, Michael focuses on an unfinished cigarette. Did, did you do anything else in the house? Maybe all over the carpet. Oh, my goodness. What's all over the carpet? Blood. Why? Because I, I, I think I stepped in it. It's all over my feet. Like this right here. It's all right here. There's blood right here. Bottom of my feet. It's... Right, I see that. Well, when I was in your house, and I saw okay. you, I saw your bloody footprints d down the hallway towards your bedroom. Okay. And you're dripping blood. Uh, wh why did you go back there? To pray to Jesus to did thank him for what he did. What did he do? He saved my family's life. How did he save their lives? He used me to shoot them or stab them. He, I didn't shoot them. He used me to stab them, and then he brought them back to newness of life. What do you mean by newness of life? He for he. My calling is my calling is my calling life is to witness to Mormons mm -hmm. and Catholics. Okay. My uh, I see the spiritual I see the spiritual realm. Okay. I'm a beginner, but I'm but I feel like I'm learning the spiritual realm pretty well. I feel like um, I feel like God is doing something with me that's going to be magnificent. That'll out. That'll just. They won't outdo. But okay. But my question is: Is what is newness of life? Newness of life. Well, they were dead in their trespasses, and now they're raised to newness of life. Okay. The, are they, they up with they, the heavenly Father? They are. They, they are seated in heavenly places. They are seated in the heavenly places. Yes. Michael is quoting directly from baptism rites, and he appears to be doing this to sound very devout. Michael's beliefs cross over into the realm of fanaticism and obsession. He appears to be so intensely focused on his ideas that he values them above all else, including the lives of his family. This extreme fixation may be what allows him to justify taking the lives of his wife and children. But were his actions based on simple impulse, or were they a calculated act? That's what isn't so clear. When authorities first arrived at the gruesome scene that morning, there were clues that suggested that this may have been more calculated than Michael wants the police to believe, and that he may not be sharing the full details of what happened. One such clue was a picture that was out of place. Next to Adriana's body was a blood-stained rendering of the Last Supper, neatly propped against the kitchen counter and the floor, positioned directly in her line of vision as she lay dying. Perhaps it was pure coincidence but the details were too unnerving to ignore. So how long do you think you're back there in your bedroom praying? No idea. Is this before or after you after. Uh, smoked a cigarette? Well, actually, you said you called 911, so... It, so I, I, must, I must have gone and prayed before I called 911. Okay. okay. Do you know how long? If you had to guess, how long? Six minutes. Okay. If I had to guess. It's interesting that he can specifically say six minutes when he appears unable to remember other details. This may be an example of him having a memory of extremes, including too many details about some things, but none about others. Was God talking to you then? Yes. Okay. What did God say? No, he was not talking to me then. Okay. I was alone. Was God talking to you when you were stabbing your family, killing your family? Yes. What was God saying? Kill them like to Christ. Them up, mm. destroy them, destroy them. They are nothing. Okay, but do you think God actually wants your family dead? That no. He wants your kids dead? No, He's the perfect example of a family. Okay, then maybe we'll... it was from Satan, mm. but it's not from Satan. Jesus is within me. His self-soothing leg rub here might be because of his discomfort at the idea that he was following evil actions. As Michael debates if his actions came from divine or evil sources, he not so subtly lifts the sheet to reveal his feet. The detective finally addresses the elephant in the room. I know that the officer saw you do that. I didn't do that on purpose. Okay. No, I don't know. I don't know how this happened. Well, I think they saw you touching him, touching your finger. No, I wasn't touching him. I swear to God. Saying I swear to God is a convincing statement and a red flag that he's being deceptive. Oh, okay. I was I was I was on the I was on the ground and I kept getting up and when I get up my foot would rub. 
Oh, I get it. And it would rub against the floor. That's how that came. What would you call that? Well, it, a burn, a burn, a burn on off the floor. Well, it looks like blood to me. It looks it's dry blood. Well, it's dry blood. It could be. I've seen that movie Stigmata. I mm-hmm. don't know what that is all about. I don't understand what that's all about. I don't really understand that yet. But I, this may be a stigmata of some kind. Maybe God's trying to show me something. In Catholicism, the term stigmata refers to marks on specific areas of the body. These marks are thought to appear spontaneously on areas that would have been injured in Jesus' crucifixion, including the hands and feet. Perhaps by referring to this, Michael is attempting to physically represent the connection he feels with his higher power, or prove that his actions were the result of a divine calling. What happened to your hand? This was, um, when I was holding the knife, I was trying to stab her. Uh She had her hand on it, too. And she was trying to push it away, and when I stabbed her, I think my hand slipped off the handle and went onto the blade. Oh, okay, so that just happened. Who put the bandage on there? The, the, the police officer that came uh, to the house. Adriana attempted to defend herself as Michael came after her. While he doesn't say it, his daughter's autopsy revealed the same. She also fought for her life. And as Michael continues, more shocking details about his family's last moments surface. Well, I had it, and I said, do you want me to... And stab you with this? And she goes, no, 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 no. She just freaked out. And I just, that's when, that's when she grabbed it. Mm-hmm. That's when she grabbed it. And that's when I pulled it back. And then my hand slipped and I cut my finger. And then I, then I sunk it into her head. Did you kick her? Yeah, I think so. In the legs. Why did you kick her? Kick her while she's down. Yeah. Make sure she's down. Make sure she's down Make sure for she's good. good. Did Was she begging for, for you not to do it? Was she telling you not to do yes, it? Yes, she was begging. What was she saying? Mike, don't do this. Don't do this. You don't know what you're doing. You don't know what you're doing. Stop, stop, stop. She was she was in a panic. I've never seen her like that, and I never want to see her like that again. And then you stabbed her in the chest? Yes. Did she say anything after that? I don't remember. I was I was so enraged. Michael says his wife called out for their daughter in her last moments. I said, she's not going to hear you. You're all by yourself. But the truth was, Adriana wasn't alone. Her daughter Valerie heard the commotion in the dining room, and in a moment of bravery, she decided to find out what was wrong. It was almost like God just put her there. Mm -hmm. I didn't see her coming. She was just there all of a sudden. Okay. And uh, and that scared me. I'm not going to lie. That scared me, and I just take it out on her. I was, I was furious. I don't know what I was furious about though. And where, where was your first, when you stabbed her, where was the first stab? The heart, the heart. I think. And how many stabs after? Maybe one. And where was that? Maybe the arm or the stomach. Okay. She was okay. dead. She was had a purple face. Okay. So far, Michael's revelations have been haunting enough but the worst is yet to come. When the detective walks Michael back through the incident with his son, he shares an unthinkable truth. And you said you were what? Was ruthless with him? Or what, yes. was, what was the word? Uh, no mercy. No, no mercy. mercy at all with him. I went after him so hard and so fast. And was that he telling you boy, to stop? He was just screaming, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. <gasps> I love him so much. I don't know how that got into me. Yeah, why would you stab him? You know, lately, I've been talking so much about my son and going to work. I'm talking about how I love my son and how dear he is to my heart and how precious he is and how God has blessed me with him. And and then I go and do something like that where I just lose control. By going on about how he's lucky to have his son... Michael seems to be trying to convince the detective that he has no sane reason to kill his son, which may be part of his attempt to reaffirm that he was not in his right mind. How many times again did you say you stabbed him? Probably four or five. He got the most. If I told you 11, would that be too much or or not that much? 11? I'm asking. That is way too much. Way too much? Yes. Okay. Do you think it's possible that you stabbed him 11 times? Why do you think it's possible? Because I wasn't, I wasn't in the right mind. I was, I was not in the right mind. The detective asks why Michael's son got the worst of his wrath. His response casts a chilling darkness over the room, 
saying, I love Brian more. Do you think what, what you did, do you think was wrong? Yes. Why? Yes and no. Killing my family is wrong. But it wasn't wrong because God is in control of all things. And he says all things work together for good for those who love the Lord. And I love the Lord. But do you know the difference between right and wrong? Yes, I okay, do. Okay, so you think it's wrong killing your family, but yes. then it's right. But No, it's, it, on the physical sense, it's wrong. But on a, in the spiritual level, it's, it's okay. Michael's reflection on the morality of killing his family indicates a certain detachment. While he understands that killing his family is wrong, he continues to verbalize his delusions. And up until this point, Michael describes the heartbreaking moments of the attack with almost no emotion. This candor suggests his actions were probably driven by mental illness, namely paranoia and delusional thinking. But despite Michael's troubled state, He's able to manage his timeline and recall most of it in vivid detail, and he's more than capable of answering questions requiring logical and analytical ability. His level of composure suggests an unsettling truth. While Michael is mentally ill, he isn't so out of his mind that he doesn't understand the tragic events of that morning. It's a common misconception that people who struggle with severe mental illness have no control over their actions. But reality isn't always so black and white. A more difficult possibility to contend with is that many individuals can be both mentally ill and in control of their choices, even Michael. If Michael is able to answer the detective's questions in his right mind, providing a detailed picture of what happened, one has to wonder if he was genuinely unable to stop himself from carrying out the violent attack in the first place. Sit tight for me, okay? And I'll be back. You gave me peace. You gave me hope. Father God, Father God, please heal them. Jesus, Jesus, heal them. This is not real. This is not real, Jesus. This is fake. You're testing me. You're testing me. Satan is in control. After the attack, neighbor after neighbor came forward as witnesses to Michael and Adriana's fighting. One neighbor told police, the couple's yelling reverberates throughout the neighborhood. Neighbors who babysat for the Millers described Michael as angry and abusive, with some witnessing Michael slapping Adriana when she tried to prevent Michael from driving after drinking. Others claimed that the children weren't allowed to go places when invited. Michael has already admitted to having troubles with alcohol. And when detectives speak with his parents, they agree. According to police reports, Michael's mother said he struggled with alcohol and substance use in the past. And at one point, his father suspected Michael of stealing prescription opioids from his home. If Michael had been drinking recently, as the bottles police found in his home suggest, the alcohol may have dampened the effectiveness of his medications, exacerbated his mental health symptoms, or both. When the detective returns, Michael asks one lingering question about his family. Uh, Can I ask you one question? Sure. Are, they're okay, right? Okay. Uh, um, your son is okay. My uh, son is okay. Yeah. He, it looks like he, he, may, he may be okay. Michael shows no sign of relief at the detective's announcement. Um, do you know why you left the knife in his shoulder? Mike. What, what, I don't know why. I don't know why. I don't know why. Well, you got to remember why. I left it there because I was scared. Mm -hmm. I was scared. And I just, I was, what the hell happened? What do I do? What do I do? And I just left it. I just left it. Did you it. try to help him at all? No, not at all. Michael rubs his head, possibly to self-soothe. And his call to 911 documented exactly this scenario in chilling detail. Are you sure they're not breathing? My son was right, I got him pretty good. 
My son is still breathing. But he's still breathing? Yes. Can you go over and can you? No, I can't. I cannot. Why not? I can't look at what I did. Okay, well, you need to, you need to face up to the reality of this. You need to go and help him. As police collect Michael's DNA and take photographs for evidence, they're able to see his injuries more closely. And it only serves to reinforce Michael's violence that morning. And the other side? Down for the flash. Is that a cut? No. Oh, uh, it might be a scratch. It might be a fingernail. Okay. Who would that be from? Um, my wife. Okay. Was she scratching at you? I don't remember. The question of the 63 pages of printed documents outlining mental health diagnosis remains. While it initially seemed to suggest that Michael may have been researching mental health disorders in order to try and fake crazy and receive leniency, there's likely a simple explanation. People with bipolar disorder are among the hardest to convince of their illness. Because of this, it's not uncommon for mental health professionals to encourage patients to research their condition, and it's possible this is what Michael was doing. However, it's still highly unusual for him to have 63 pages of research. It's rare that any doctor would send that much information, as they're more likely to send home one or two pages of information about a diagnosis, leaving the discovery as still very odd. While it's possible that Michael was indeed experiencing psychiatric troubles, it's equally plausible that he exaggerated symptoms to avoid the long arm of the law. I don't know why my hands are so swollen. Those well, cuffs were... Well, I don't know if it's the cuffs. They were brutal. They're not going to cause that. I don't uh, know why they're so swollen. Could like have been that. that. Were you hitting them more than, than you said? Despite his predicament, or perhaps in an attempt to smooth it over or ignore it, Michael makes casual conversation with the officers one of whom was a target of Michael's outbursts while in his holding cell. Sorry I was such a dickhead in there. I just, I had lots of things going on in my mind. I was kicking the door, being a jerk. Yeah, I'm sorry. Cuffs were hurting, I'm sure, you know. Cuffs, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm in good hands. Have you ever listen to rap or hip-hop music at all? Have you heard that new song by The Dream, Walking on the Moon? You'll, you'll know when you hear it. We got me walking on the moon. That's nice. The dream, he's the one singing, Shorty is a 10, a 10, yeah. Yeah, that song rocks. As detectives swab blood stains from his body, Michael carries on singing and chatting, but soon enough, his smile fades. His last remarks are nothing, if not haunting. What do you do with that foot I think it was all just a bad dream. I think I really think it was just all a bad dream. After surgery and an extensive stay in ICU, Michael's son eventually recovered. He sustained multiple stab wounds to his torso, chest, upper back, and wrist, and required a feeding tube during his recovery due to his injuries. Michael Miller was charged with two counts of first degree murder and one count of attempt to commit murder in the first degree. The county prosecutor argued that Michael's case demonstrated the premeditation necessary for a first-degree murder charge and that his crimes were carried out in an especially heinous, cruel, or depraved manner, warranting aggravating circumstances and consideration for the death penalty. Adriana's sister addressed Michael directly, saying, She would have done anything and everything for you. She never could have imagined in her worst nightmares that one day she would have to try to protect herself from you. Even so, it was at the pleas of Adriana's family that the judge took the death penalty off the table in his sentencing. In October of 2009, Michael accepted a plea deal, and by December, Michael was convicted of both counts of first-degree murder, for which he was given life sentences, as well as another ten and a half years for the attempted murder of his son. There's very little information released publicly about his son Brian and his life after surviving the attack and the loss of his mother and sister. What can be pieced together seems to indicate that he's living with an aunt and that those looking after him have been careful to protect him. He is likely either just turned 18 or will be soon. <laughs>